So our next session will be WT Beep is JWT. So uh, uh, we will have Machi Shredder from Akamai to talk about uh, this topic with us. So hi, Machi. Hi, how are you? Uh, great. OK, I can see you, your camera right now. Could you try to share your screen? Yeah, sure. Great. You should see yeah, my slides right now. now. Great. OK, I will pass the time to you now, Machi. Thank you. Thank you. So, hello, my name is Maciej Treder. Uh, I'm from Krakow in Poland. Uh, this is my handle. Uh, you can find me on all of the social networks which Logotypes uh, you see right now under the same nickname. Uh, and today I'm going to speak a little bit about what is JWT, because this term is often confusing for people. Uh, and we are going to get a little bit deeper into, into the idea of JWT and when to use them, uh, what, what is the purpose of this uh, technology. This presentation is available for you offline on my speaker deck. Uh, you can scan this QR code right now uh, if you would like to get back to the slides uh, afterwards. I'm going to share this QR code at the very end of my presentation. So if you don't have a chance to scan it right now, no, don't worry. You will get a chance to do that uh, later. So let's go to the point. Uh, and before we will get deeper into JWT and what are those, I would like to ask you to get back in memories to the school time when you were first, that was first time in your life when you were meeting your new colleagues. Uh, and let's meet them, let's uh, meet the actors. We've got a uh, Bob here uh, on, the, on the very left. We got an Anna and we have a bad guy in the middle. So Bob is going to send a message to Anna, which says that he likes her. Of course, he's not going to tell her that directly uh, because he's too shy. So he just write down a message, put it into the envelope and ask your colleagues to pass this uh, message uh, to Anna. But we've got that uh, not nice guy, a uh, man in the middle, uh, which want to make some mess in this communication. So he changes the message content and pushes that to the Anna. So this is how disaster occurs and how relationships uh, are broken because Anna gets angry, Bob gets crying. Nobody is happy in this situation. Even the bad guy is not happy, I believe. So what Bob and Anna might do uh, to make their communication secret? Uh, what they decided to do is to share a public key, a key between each other. Uh, we in computer science call this a public key. Uh, and they are going to use this key to produce the cipher so nobody could read their messages. And in this particular case, when they are sharing just one key, they are using what we call a symmetric cipher. So the same key is used as well for encryption as for decryption. The problem starts when the key gets compromised by a bad guy. At this moment, he's as uh, able to as well read as produce the messages. To avoid the situation and address this pitfall, uh, we came with the asymmetric cipher. In asymmetric ciphers, we are using the pair of keys, the public and private key. One is used for producing the messages and the other one is using for decrypting them. Uh, those key can be used interchangeably. Uh, so if something is called private key, uh, you can still share it with others, or, uh, but you need to remember that the corresponding public key should be kept uh, secret. The important thing uh, is to just share only one of the keys. How those keys are produced? First of all, they are based on the one-way function. Uh, what one-way function is, uh, we, are, we are calling the one-way function if it's easy to calculate the output of the function and it's hard to calculate 
what were the producers of those functions. So for example, multiplying primes uh, is an example of such, uh, of such function. So to calculate the keys, to generate them, we are just picking up two prime numbers. In our particular case, let's pick the small ones for easier calculation. Uh, then we are uh, calculating that uh, the, our function output, so the one-way function output, in this case 33, and we are calculating the C number. Uh, so the C number would be uh, necessary to find out uh, the, the second part of the key, which is called uh, N in our case. Uh, sorry, which is called E, which is the exponential, uh, which we are going to use to produce our, our code output. So to calculate what is the uh, what is the second number which we need for for our key, we just need to solve the equation. Uh, we, we just need to solve the equation e multiplied by d minus one modulus c is equal to zero. In other words, we are looking for a number which is relatively prime to c. What relatively prime means is that those two numbers have just one common greatest factor, uh, which is one. So once we have those two, uh, those two numbers, uh, we have E and uh, we have D as well, uh, we can say what is our private and public key. The N which we have and we calculate at the very beginning is our modulus. So the number of characters that we can use in the cipher and the E and D respectively are exponents of private and public key. So uh, to how, how this flow between Bob and Anna looks right now. So what they are doing, they are exchanging their public keys with each other and keep private key in secret. So they exchange the keys which they are using to encrypt the message. So Bob gives Anna a key and says, hey, use this key to encrypt messages which you want to send to me. And Anna did exactly say same with Bob. I'm sorry, because I just seen the slide that I changed the names of our actors. They are Mike and Kate. Uh, so Bob sometimes is called Mike and Kate is sometimes called Anna. So they exchange their key, use those keys to produce the output. So now the message, I like you, uh, they use different equations to produce cipher and different equation to produce the message out of the cipher. So it's much harder to break for an attacker. And if their keys are compromised by a bad guy, he is able only to encrypt messages. He is only able to write them not to read them. So he don't know what the communication is going on. Uh, some may say that if the attacker get the key, he got a modulus, uh, so he know what is the output of the two-factor, one-way fun one function. But if you are following the RSA rules, the standards which are mentioned in the documentation, it's very hard to find out what primes has been used uh, to create, to generate the key. Right now, you can see an example of the key size of 1024 bits. And in um, information technology, on the daily usage, we are often used keys which are um, up to 4000 bits. So just imagine how big those numbers are. But attacker can still produce messages, so he can uh, act on behalf of his victim. How to solve this problem? This is where we are coming with the idea of signing. And signing uh, is uh, what to do to sign your message and to prove that you are the sender. First of all, of course, write it. Uh, you need to previously uh, exchange the public key with the receiver. So once you write your message, you are hashing it with some hash method. Uh, then you are encrypting the original message with your private key. 
So the receiver will use the public key to decrypt it. Then you are combining the original message together with the hash, encrypt message and hash with their public key. So the public key which Bob received from Anna. And this is what you are sending to her. Now, when Anna want to verify the message, if verify and decrypt, so she want to read the message and verify who is the sender, she is of course receiving it, then decrypting using her private key. And she got a go original, original message and the hash, which is encrypted. Right now, he can hash this message, decrypt the hash which she received and compress those hashes. So right now you are using two parts of the key to produce and sign the message. So there, even if the, you've got a man in the middle, he's not able to, do, uh, to, to perform the signing operation and prove that his victim is an, is an author of the message. But signing doesn't need to be applied only to the encrypted messages and it doesn't need to be done with the private key. Let's imagine the situation when we have a king who have the many, many citizens in his kingdom. So if he wants to prove that he is an author of some message, of some announcement, he of course does not ask everyone to produce the private key and uh, gets their public key which the, he would use to, to sign the message for each particular citizen. Instead of that, as you probably know, King plus Stamp gives you a sign and announcement when everyone can check that this announcement has been produced that by King. So King is producing such stamp on his end. <clears throat> And in the IT world, such stamp is a private public key. So he is keeping his private keys secretly and share the public key with everyone in the kingdom so they can verify if the king signed this message with his private key. How he is producing those messages if he is not encrypting them is very similar flow. So first of all, he of course creates the message then he hash it and he encrypts only the hash with the private key, combine those all together. And this is what he is sharing with the, uh, with the citizens. Now each citizen can get the public key, get the message, uh, hash the original message, decrypt the signature and compare the hashes uh, to check if the if the signature match so this is the flow which most people call jwt but this in fact is not jwt so what is that this is a json web signature so something which you will find often around the internet where if you are working with apis then for sure you'll find strings like that where is an encoded string uh, so with the with the two dots uh, separating the three parts of the string. Uh, if you would decode that, you will get a just plain text together with some signature. So this is our king announcement with the stamp, uh, which is proving who is the author of this announcement. What are those three parts are? So the first one is the host header. Uh, the host stands for JavaScript Object Signing and Encryption. This is the name of the AITF working group, which works on standardizing the representation of integrity, uh, protecting data uh, using JSON data structures. The second part in blue is a payload. So the body of message which you want to send. Uh, the, the red one, the header specifies how this payload is going to be prepared and the whole token. Uh, the last part is signature. So this is to prove who is the author of this, uh, of the signature of this token. So 
if that example what not what's not JWT what is JWT in fact uh, and here I need to say that in some way I, I got kind of lied to you because JSON web signature is an implementation of JSON web token so this is why people often use this interchangeably you could think about the JSON web token as an, an abstract class uh, which is uh, which have some uh, have some abstraction implemented by the JSON web signature and JSON web encryption uh, which is a little bit being that we are not going to cover today okay let's go to the uh, so so let's keep the um, what the let's keep the practice which people have across the world and call json web signature and jwt interchangeably let's use that terms as people as people do so json web token as i said is built up from the header payload and signature inside the header and payload you saw something what is called claims and those claims are divided into three groups one of those group are registered claims. Those are the claims which are specifying, uh, often in a header, you've got an algorithm and type, but those can be in the payload as well. And claims from payload can be in the header as well. So don't be surprised if, the, if you would find something like that. So in header, we are often specifying the algorithm and type of the token. Uh, inside the body, we are specifying who is issuing this information, uh, who is a subject of the information, for who this information, information is prepared, when, it's, when it is prefer, prepared, before which time it shouldn't be used, before each time it's not valid, until which time it's valid. And finally, you could use also the unique identifier uh, if you are using the one-time the single use uh, JSON web tokens in your application, in your architecture. The second group of claims are custom claims. And those are divided into, into two groups. So this is how we are getting to free. Because custom claim can be public and private. Uh, the difference between uh, private and public is that the public claim is a private claim which became public by registering uh, in the IANA JSON web token registry. Uh, the registration process is paid as far as I remember. And you might want to do that to avoid the name collisions if you want to use some custom claim uh, uh, across the applications around the internet. So you are, uh, you are producing JSON web tokens which are going to be used by others than, than you. If you are using JSON web token in your internal system, you are fine to go on with private claims. Okay, so we covered what JWT is. Let's take a look why JWT uh, has been found and what are the use cases for JWT. Let's take a look at the authorization flow of the microservices application before JWT uh, came to the stage. So we've got an actor, let's call her Kate. We've got an authorization service. We've got a booking service, gate service, and flight service. So this is a flight booking or flight management application. What Anna can do, uh, what Kate can do, she can authorize herself using the authorization service. Probably she got some user ID in the encrypted version, of course. So she could not, uh, she could not be. Uh, she, she could not um, make herself a, a different user, use someone's different user ID and act as someone other in the system. And whenever she's posting to one of the microservices, she is, of course, including this user ID. So the microservice can add the authorization service if she has an ability, has a privilege to perform an action which she's trying to perform. Uh, 
you could of course move the public key to the microservices but still uh, decrypting the uh, decrypting anything it's a time consuming uh, time consuming um, action and you don't and in fact you don't need to do it on every request because with JWT Anna can again post a request to authorization server get the token in the back uh, send the request to the services and services instead of uh, verifying the signature immediately they can preliminary check if anna have given privilege in her privileges array and if she have that's the moment where they are starting to verify signature so they are incorporating the time consuming uh, process you may think about that as a uh, um, hash code and equals uh, methods so you could uh, you could preliminary check like hash code preliminary checks if two objects are not equal but so so this is what hash code says for sure but if you want to check for sure if objects are equals you need to go to equals method same with json web token here we are checking if the coded token has given privilege and if have if it have it we are going to verify signature process which is time consuming moreover thanks to jwt you can move this preliminary validation to the load balancer and offload your microservices uh, to do not handle requests uh, which does not have um, a particular uh, privilege and you can also offload your whole application and delegate the validation process to third parties like Akamai, who I am working for. So we could, our content delivery network could verify the claim and signature on behalf of you before the request even reaches your system. Uh, we ship this, uh, we ship this possibility in the product called API Gateway and one of the parts of api gateway uh, is the process of verifying the json web token claims you can verify the validation process for each of your endpoints separately or you can uh, generate the the general validation rules which will apply to your whole api uh, it's very flexible so definitely give it a try for further reading uh, I strongly recommend you to go on uh, with the article of Jeff Costa on Akamai Learn blog and my own article on Twilio blog post about protecting uh, microservices with JSON web tokens and Twilio Alfi. Let's move to the second use case of JSON web tokens, which is OAuth. What OAuth is, is the, you know, something what has been found to simplify the process of the application authorization, but in my, I, in my feeling, it's right now a little bit complicating it because I am always asking myself a question, which social network did I use to sign up into this particular system? So I'm always running with the five accounts uh, where I am using only one, and I'm just trying different uh, of providers to check which one I used to uh, to go on with this particular uh, request. But let's take a look how OAuth works and how JWT can improve this flow. So OAuth is about the third-party application which you can see on the very left. Let's say it's a mobile application. And two and the other actors, which have two persons here on the right side, is the authorization and the resource server. Let's say that two on the right are Facebook, and our app is going to request some pictures from our user Facebook profile. So our application first authenticates within the Facebook authorization system, authentication system. Then we are getting the access token. 
And using this access token, we are requesting for the resource for user pictures. What the resource system does, it validates this token against the auth service. And once the token is valid, it comes back to us with the resource. If we would use JWT token here, we could, off, uh, we could avoid that additional communication and validate the token. The token could be validated by the resource server uh, and preliminary checked. Okay, so uh, that was about the OAuth. Let me uh, quickly leave this slide for a while. And let's move forward to, uh, to the second uh, to, to another part uh, we, uh, about JSON Web Tokens, which is JSON, uh, JSON uh, Web Keys. So JWKS is asking the uh, concerns like, what if you will lose your key or someone will compromise or you want to invalidate someone access, you want to invalidate some key quickly. This is where we are coming to JSON Web Key Set. So you don't need to share your public key with, uh, with your audience with, for who you are uh, producing the tokens. You can ask them to get those keys from you by themselves. So the flow of JSON Web Token validation together with the JSON Web Key set uh, is, uh, looks like that. So you are requesting the the token from the authorization server, you are getting this token back and you get two new claims inside, the key ID and the JKU, which stands for JSON Web Key Set URL. And right now, what the, what the system need to do when it wants to validate the token, to validate the signature, is go to this URL, ask for the key with the particular ID and use this public key to verify the signature. Those keys are kept in, uh, in the similar uh, or the same format as uh, JWTs because they are kept in JSONs. Uh, so there are set of entries together with values and those entries are key type, of course, key ID, so they can be uh, identified algorithm for which key should be used where key is used because it can be, it not need to be key used for signature. It can be key used for anything other, for encrypting, decrypting, etc. Uh, of course, what is the exponent and what is the modulus? Uh, uh, those are the numbers which we are, we were calculating at the very beginning. As you can see, modulus is a quite big number, uh, but a part of those standard attributes they can also keep some attributes uh, which are specific for private keys used for encryption. Uh, so they could have a prime Q factors. Uh, you could keep there the information used for Chinese reminder algorithm and so on and so on and so on. Uh, let's take a look how JWKS can protect you uh, against the a bad guy who compromised your private key and he can produce the JSON web tokens on by himself. Uh, but Sorry, while Machi. you find out that the key has been compromised, you can just rotate the public key. And now whenever attacker is trying to use uh, the bad token, the, the wrong token used with the compromised private key, then the public key taken from the repository just won't match. So the process of verifying signature will fail. Okay, because we are running out of time, I'm going to skip some of the pitfall and vulnerabilities. Uh, but for yes, sure, we Machi. need to speak about the... Hello, Machi, can you, take, can you hear me? Yeah, so I can I think hear you. Time is running up so yeah I, I think for for that part if uh the audience has any question about it they, yeah, they sure. will send it over to you yeah thank you so i think uh, machi gave us a very in-depth explanation on jwt and public key infrastructure and all those kind of stuff so yeah it could be kind of hardcore sometimes but do try to uh ping machi for further discussion if you 
have any questions. Yeah, let me just quickly, quickly, quickly go to the QR code. Back. And here the QR code for presentation. You can find me on Twitter. And of course, I'm going to stay here on the chat for some time so you could reach me. Yeah, 